thank you for coming. Um, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome. Thank you for choosing this presentation. I'm sure there was a lot of choice of other good, good uh, talks. Uh, we're here to tell you about our project to make the world's first skydiving robot. Um, on this talk, we're going to uh, take you through the history of the project. Uh, we'll talk about the different design iterations and how we manufacture either, each of the versions. Uh, we'll show you some video of the live tests we did over the summer and uh, tell you what's coming next and what the future holds. So we'll start with some introductions. Uh, my name is David Alatore. I've been jumping since 2011 and I currently work as a researcher at the Rolls-Royce UTC in uh, manufacturing technology. My work is uh, to do with robotics. I do control systems and sensor design for snake robots that work inside jet engines. And uh, so yeah, it relates a bit to this, to this stuff. And I'm Peter Storey. Uh, I've been skydiving since 2012, uh, and I now work as an applications engineer at the Autodesk Technology Center in Birmingham. Uh, so put simply, my company makes uh, software for making things. Uh, and my sector is basically in design and manufacturing software. Uh, so uh, my job is essentially showing off what the software can do. So uh, new and advancing technologies such as 3D printing, uh, machining, and robotics. So you can see how that links quite nicely into this, uh, this project. OK, so with introductions done, we wanted to start off by explaining why we're doing this. Why a skydiving robot? Uh, so we could go on about all the potentially lucrative applications where we make make millions replacing camera flyers jobs and uh, filming tandems and four ways and all that sort of stuff. In truth, uh, we do this because we really enjoy doing it for the same reason we do any of these skydives in the background there. We really enjoy doing it and we have the ability to. At the moment, we have uh, no particular ties to any companies or any funding or any other goals beyond continuing to work on this project alongside our day jobs. Um, and you'll see as this, pro uh, this uh, presentation goes on, um, we're not holding anything back. Uh, like We're not trying to do any smoke and mirrors here. We're just showing you what we've been up to. Uh, so let's start at the beginning. Um, this all began as a research project uh, along with a couple of our friends and um, university mates, uh, Tom Shorten and Tom Dryden. Our objectives were to first build an autonomous skydiving robot um, and second end of the year with a decent mark in our group design and mate module. Come on in, guys. Come on in. <laughs> There's space at the front here. There's a couple of seats here. <laughs> so yeah, the, the intent was um, to make a robot that could uh, be thrown out of the plane with you. It would match your fall rate, um, move relative to you, and then at the end of the jump, it would deploy its own parachute uh, and land on its own safely. So at the end of uh, our first year uh, working on this, uh, we've finished with what we call version one, uh, and a pretty decent mark in our design and make module. Uh, some of you might already be familiar with the first robot we built. Um, this is the original freefall camera, and uh, it's based on a hemispherical design, and the reasoning for that was to basically simulate an, an arching skydiver, a fat skydiver, but an arching, uh, just a, a smooth, stable shape. Uh, the bottom of the robot is uh, made in entirely out of steel. Uh, Pete, slide. Uh, and uh, that makes it quite bottom heavy and stable. Um, the, the control surfaces are the vertical ailerons that you see on the top right picture. Um, they move independently, and so they can allow the robot to turn in place, side to light, and move uh, forwards and back. And for full rate control, we use the retractable flaps that you see in the video on the bottom left. Uh, they change the surface area of the robot, so they behave like the camera wings of a camera flyer. Uh, the, this version weighs about seven and a bit kilos, so that's the, like, the heaviest bowling ball you can use, the number 16. Um, the, uh, the most important sensor on this robot is the vision uh, system in the front. And what that does is it, uh, it tells the robots the position and size of a blob of a given color. And so it can track this blob. And using the size, you can calculate the distance. And so it can keep a distance from the, from the target as well. Um, other sensors inside the robot include a barometer for uh, measuring the altitude and uh, knowing when to deploy the parachute, and a GPS to steer the parachute, uh, which sits in that hole in the back. Um, 
The parachute itself is a custom made optimum uh, 30. Uh, no, you can't jump it. Um, <laughs> it was made for us by Performance Designs, and uh, the, it, we also have a custom miniature deployment bag, bridle, and tiny pilot chute. Uh, Aww. Aww. <laughs> um, you can come have a play with them later. Um, they were made by various riggers in the UK as well. Um, the deployment for the version one works pretty much the same as a, as a regular skydive rig. Uh, a spring throws the pilot chute into the airstream and that pulls a closing pin that opens some flaps and pulls out the deployment bag and so on. Um, and in the robot there's also a Cypress uh, AAD cutter and that can also initiate the deployment in a completely separate circuit. So if there's a total failure of all the electronics, this AAD will still save the robot like a normal AAD would. Um, throughout the year that we did this project, we've uh, used different types and sizes of wind tunnels to do some tests. The first one was a homemade wind tunnel we, we, uh, we made in, at uni to test different shapes of um, scale models and uh, different weight distributions and things like that. And once we picked one that worked, we took it to a horizontal wind tunnel to measure the drag forces and see that the drag flaps uh, worked the way we expected. And once all of that was done, we took it to uh, iFly Manchester and uh, did some control tests in the, in the tunnel. Um, so this is some onboard footage from the tunnel. <coughs> um, the vision sensor was calibrated to follow that green, green spot that I'm wearing, that glove. Um, uh, the first test we used an orange glove and it kept looking at those X's in the walls and getting distracted like a hi hyperactive child. Um, just didn't know which X to look at so it kept uh, jumping around. Uh, the green was better but it, you can still see that it gets distracted by reflections and there was a plant in air kicks that we didn't account for. <laughs> um, but it, we still managed to track the target. You can see like when it's when it's doing the tracking and it knows the object, it, it works reasonably well. Um, so when, with these test results, we, we, asked, to, we asked the CAA and uh, the and drop zones for permission to drop it from a plane. Uh, but they weren't happy to let us put the, something that big into free fall. So we did some parachute tests, uh, it, it just, a, just a parachute, but never, never allowed to take it into free fall. Um, but we learned a lot of lessons just from taking it in the tunnel. So things like the, uh, how it behaves aerodynamically, the controllability, uh, uh, pitfalls with the vision sensor uh, that we could replace with other sensors and so on. And we fed that into a, another design iteration. We then moved into our fourth year of university um, uh, after completing version one. Uh, and we all worked on um, separate research projects which fed back into the design of version two. Uh, so it's essentially version one with some incremental improvements. Uh, so one of the main focuses was to make it narrower and hence reduce the weight. So as Dave said, it was weighing something like 7.2 kilos. Uh, so we really needed to get that weight down where we could. Um, so we made space savings uh, wherever possible. Uh, on top of that, uh, we did some uh, shape optimization studies. The top left image is kind of a visual representation of what those shape optimization studies came out with. We also really thought about design for manufacturability, so if we wanted to make multiple of these. Uh, so almost every metal part on this robot was designed to be laser cut from a single sheet of steel, uh, including this um, nice space-saving drag flap design that we've got. Uh, and all of this was welded together by uh, a friend of ours, Paul Fletcher, who some of you may know. Um, we also modified uh, the vision sensor to see an infrared beacon, again, as uh, Dave was saying on the previous slide. We didn't quite manage to finish uh, this design by the end of our final year of university, uh, and we all went off to do separate jobs around the UK, uh, graduate jobs. Uh, but Dave and I continued to work on this in our spare time, uh, in any spare time we had. Um, so five to six kilos is what we managed to get this down to. You can come around and pick it up, it's still quite hefty. Um, so the problems we faced getting permission to test this from a plane were probably still true. We, we weren't going to get any permission to, to throw it in the UK at least. Um, so during the design of version two, um, I started to look at ma making a miniature design 
that keeps as much of the functionality as possible. Um, and uh, I started off with a diameter of 100 millimeters, just because that way we could take the, the weight down from five kilos to one kilo, so we can cut it in, uh, by five. And uh, this started off just as a thought experiment in my office when I was procrastinating. And uh, eventually, it so, sort of became more and more realistic, and I thought, oh, uh, yeah, I'm going to build it. So I built it in secret without telling Pete, <laughs> and uh, to, to surprise him with a, with a radical new robot. Um, so this is what I came up with, and it's uh, quite cut down in, uh, in its, in its uh, size, as you can see the, the comparison. Uh, the camera is just a GoPro session, and it doesn't tilt uh, like the other robots did, so it, it kind of has to be in on, in on level with the skydiver, so that's one, uh, one drawback in the functionality. Uh, the optimum parachute was replaced with a round parachute that sits in the back and it's just deployed into the airstream. Uh, it's a round similar to those used for uh, recovery of model rockets. And uh, so that's another, another drawback. So the, the idea is more like using this as a smart space ball that can film you. So you catch it after the jump, you can clip it onto your harness and uh, uh, you, you lose that ability to let it just do its own thing and land on its own. And uh, the other thing is the vision sensor got replaced by these infrared sensors. And so it can do direction and fall rate, but not distance. So again, this was just the best that I could come up with to fit it into this, uh, this smaller space. Um, I can show you how the, uh, the vision works, how the, sensor, how the sensors behave. So it sort of calibrates the, um, the altitude first. And then if you walk that way, then you see the fins move to react to where he is and point it. So it's quite a simple thing. It just, if it's not, if all, fours ca all four sensors can't see the target, then it reacts accordingly. So if you block half of it, then it thinks that it needs to turn that way. Um, but uh, as you can see, like this, the, um, Sacrifices do result in a substantial uh, reduction in size. And uh, it weighs 800 grams, this one. Uh, we'll, we'll pass it around to you so you can have a feel. But it's, uh, it made me a lot more optimistic that we, could, uh, that we could secure permission. So this is what I showed to Pete to say, let's put version 2 on hold and, uh, and try to make this into something we can skydive with. Um, <laughs> yep. uh, so version 4 is kind of like a version 3.1, if you like, in that very little of the overall principles have changed. You can see that overall it looks pretty similar, uh, but we absolutely needed to redesign it to uh, make the best use of available space uh, and make it more rugged and uh, able to withstand live tests. Um, I don't know if you said, Dave, that uh, version 3 was too light. Uh, it is too light. Yeah, so um, we, we had to yeah, make use of the space to make it heavier, in fact, so that it would fall at the same speed as, as us as skydivers. Uh, so yeah, we redesigned the robot from scratch in Fusion 360. Uh, so what you're seeing on the screen right now is a sped up version of every operation that was carried out to, in the software to design the robot. And now, um, as an impartial source, I'm hoping Dave will verify uh, that this software is excellent and was really helpful in us uh, for designing this robot. If it's not clear, this software is designed by, uh, made by the company I work for. Uh, <laughs> uh, so all the data is stored in the cloud uh, so we could collaborate really easily. Um, uh, and we never found ourselves with duplicate data as we sometimes found ourselves uh, with uh, on previous versions. Uh, and this software is actually free for um, hobbyists and startups. Um, and this, 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 is not, this is not a sales pitch, and I'm no salesman. Um, if I was, I would probably not be showing you our free software. Um, uh, so yeah, with the design work done, um, uh, this is where it came in really handy, uh, working for Autodesk, and in particular in uh, an office where we have a technology center. Uh, so at this point, I was uh, nearing the end of my grad scheme. Uh, and I just joined the department that looks after the manufacturing facility. Uh, so my boss, uh, luckily, was uh, really happy for me to put time into making this skydiving robot and to, uh, into making it a reality. Um, so yeah, I put time into um, designing it and manufacturing it. So we 3D printed some of the parts, machined most of the rest uh, on our CNC machines. Uh, bottom right-hand photo, I put a picture of uh, one of our machinists, Steve. Um, 
And Paul Steve is um, much more used to making massive parts for automotive and uh, the aerospace industries, like big meter long parts. And we had to we had we had him making these tiny little correct connecting rods, which you'll you'll see on the on the robot. Um, so apologies to Steve for that. Um, and then, yeah, after a couple of months of uh, redesign and uh, manufacture, uh, we ended up with a finished robot. Uh, and at this point, uh, you'd expect we should be ready for some testing in the sky, right? Wrong. Uh, we still had a fair bit of work left to do. Uh, so we started off by reaching out to Skydive Buzz, uh, Skydive 99, to see if they um, to see if they would be happy to let us test there. Um, uh, and they, they were happy with that, provided we had the appropriate permissions and insurance. So from there, we went to the Civil Aviation Authority, uh, and uh, getting permission from them probably took the longest time out of anything, even longer than designing and making the thing. Uh, so people have jumped with silly things uh, in the past, you know, space balls, bowling balls in other countries. But sadly, the British authorities are a bit too sensible and for some reason like to protect property and people on the ground. Um, so nevertheless, we did manage to get through that hurdle and eventually got permission from them. Uh, so it was on to finding insurance, someone who would actually insure us to throw a robot out of a plane in the UK. Um, and as you can imagine, most people were saying no. Um, the main problem is it doesn't fit neatly into any existing insurance categories. It's not, it's not really a drone, um, certainly not a skydiver. Uh, so most of the main companies uh, were generally confused and yeah, didn't want to know anything about it's it. It's the problem with being first. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but we got lucky, we got really lucky. Uh, we got in contact uh, with the BMFA, I don't know if any of you know them, the British Model Flying Association, uh, and they are to drone enthusiasts uh, what the BPA are to us, to skydivers. Um, and as an extension of their annual membership, they have uh, this insurance policy, uh, which, what are you doing? I'm, I'm, he turned it on, so I want to <laughs> show him the, the uh, beacon. It tracks this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so in, in addition to their uh, annual membership, they have a, an insurance ins extension which covers, and I've written this down, flights undertaken while the primary purpose is other than sporting and recreational, uh, but where the pilot does not directly benefit financially. And that was, that was us down to a T. Um, and uh, to add to that, their development officer, the guy who helps us get the insurance, is also a skydiver. He's a member of the BPA. So that, again, came in really lucky there. So with that all sorted, it was actually finally time to do some live testing. So once Pete had sorted the paperwork, because it was just Pete, <laughs> uh, it was time for the first ever free fall drop test. Um, and uh, for, for these tests, I made a remote control um, to, so that we can just isolate what we control and uh, keep, keep the test simple at first before we give it a beacon to track. So we can just control the position or the fall rate. The flaps on this one are not, are not currently on. Um, but you get the picture. Um, so the plan for the test was, was quite simple. We get out, let go of the, of the robot, um, adjust its terminal velocity to match ours, and uh, just watch it. Um, after that, we would uh, catch it, Pete would catch it, uh, deploy his parachute, attach it to his harness, and land. Um, none of our robots have flown completely free before. The f footage you saw in the tunnel, tunnel, they were tethered to the net or they were being held by, by someone uh, from behind because we, for safety, we didn't want it crashing into the glass walls of the tunnel. Um, so this really was a first uh, test of what it does completely independently in free fall. Um, the, this presentation, we don't want to hide anything and, uh, and pretend that we're the best engineers in the world. We make mistakes. And uh, spoiler alert, the robot wobbles a lot in free fall. So the footage is a bit nauseating. Um, but uh, when you're watching this, look past the wobble. And you, you'll see that they, uh, we actually control the fall rate. And that, that works well. And the jump goes to plan, because like, we, we all made it down in one piece. So you want to? About time. There it is.
Oh yeah. Mate, you're on camera. Hi buddy. Oh yeah. <laughs> so what went wrong? Um, initially, in our naive minds, uh, we thought that the low center of mass, because of the ballast at the bottom that you can see here, um, and the high center of drag, because of all the control surfaces being quite high up, uh, mean that it would tend to fall straight. And the symmetry of the body would also mean that it just it, it stays pointing one direction. And for most things, that, that, that's true. That, that's a fair assumption to make. But what we didn't consider is that we made it so light and so small that other forces can take hold quite easily because it, it doesn't have that much inertia, like something much bigger. You can move about. It takes more energy to move it about. Um, so as soon as there's any tilt, the drag on the side facing down increases and the drag on the side facing the other way decreases. Uh, and that difference on something this small is enough to overcome the stability and to push it to the other side um, so there's high drag on one side, it's, uh, it's, it has enough force to make it, to push it onto the other side and then there's enough drag on, on the back uh, and that pushes onto the other side and so on. And uh, this wobble grows until uh, eventually it just reaches a steady uh, rate of wobbling and uh, because the ballast is, is heavy enough to keep it uh, pointing the same way. Um, so here's some evidence of that, we've closed it up. And you can see how it, it matches the, that uh, it's wobbling from one fin to the other, from one flap to the other, uh, at, at, a, at a rate that m matches with that, uh, that explanation. Um, so on the next jump, we added the rotation control with the remote again uh, to hopefully be able to counteract some of this effect. And uh, yes, by, by, by stopping it with the, with the rotation of the fin. So ho hopefully we we were going to at least slow down the wobble some. And uh, this is what happened. <laughs> you happy? Very happy. What could possibly go wrong?
There she is. Oh my god, I'm nervous. Yeah. Is there going to be a hole in the ground? Ah. <laughs> Wait, it's on? It's still on. Let me turn it off. Put it out of its misery. Sadness. I'm, this is the testing has gone well. Oh my god! She's still on. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hey, buddy. <laughs> well. High five feet. <laughs> No smoke and mirrors. So yeah, mixed emotions uh, after that jump. Uh, we were really annoyed at ourselves at having to bail on it, uh, but at the same time, uh, so pleased to have the chance to test the parachute uh, and actually see it deploy beneath us. Uh, it seems, uh, I think the keen-eyed among you did notice it spinning uh, when it came into land. You see that? Yeah. Um, so we wanted to take some time to address what was happening there. So naturally, we, um, uh, we tested the parachute um, uh, previously, but never at uh, terminal velocity. That's the whole point of these tests. Um, so this um, image on the screen shows you a cross section of the robot. So the robot's facing this way. This is the um, this is the GoPro here, and this is the parachute tube, and this is where the parachute attaches in. And you can see that uh, there's obviously a, a distance between where the parachute attaches and where the center of mass is. So in the same way that we pivot forward as our parachute deploys, uh, the robot was going to pivot backwards uh, when when its parachute deployed. You're right there, Rosie. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, we, 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 were, we were okay with that. We, we accepted that it was, it was a trade-off um, between, um, trade between that, that distance between the center of mass and the attach point uh, and keeping the robot size down. It's something that we figured we had to do. Um, and also because it's only intended to be used in emergencies, uh, we, we were okay with it. Uh, but we were we were shocked to find how violently it did swing backwards. Um, it actually ripped through the shell uh, of the robot and through the parachute tray. Um, you can see it there. Ripped all the way through through there. Through all that. Uh, and that was enough to damage some of the lines that you saw in the video, um, and hence the spinning landing. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the robot landed faster than it was intended to, of course, with a inflated parachute. But um, uh, we were encouraged to find how much it actually slowed down from terminal velocity. Uh, so version five, uh, this is uh, what we've got in the making. Uh, this time, make it better. Um, so we toyed with fixing the problems we had while sticking with the current architecture. Uh, but we eventually decided if we're going to make version five, uh, then let's make the skydiving robot we always wanted to make, even if it means making it a bit heavier again. Uh, so this slide uh, sums up uh, some of the changes that we're going to be making going into version 5. Um, so as you saw, catching the robot was unreliable. Uh, so we're reintroducing uh, the Optimum 30 uh, parachute that um, we had on the first couple of versions. 
Uh, we also found it was too unstable in flight, so we're going to try and greatly increase the center of drag above the center of mass. So on the screen there in the middle, uh, the blue uh, the blue icon is uh, representing the center of drag, the red icon the center of mass. If we can raise that up above it, um, it should be a lot more stable. And that was that's always the intention with any with any skydiving robot. It's the same reason that you arch when you're skydiving. Um, we also think that the camera is two directional. We want to emphasize fun with this robot. Not we don't want an all sing all dancing robot that replaces camera flying jobs. We want something that you go and have a fr fun free fly jump with, for instance. Um, so that's the reason for adding a 360 camera in. Uh, so this is where we're at right now, and I know this is uh, very much still being designed. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is, of course, it's much more elongated. Uh, so in order to keep the weight down, we need to keep the diameter as uh, as small as possible, um, whilst whilst still fitting the parachute in. Uh, but counterintuitively, we also need the drag flaps, the all the control surfaces, as high as possible to get the center of drag up. Uh, so we've decided to control them via cables, which means that we can get all the electronics down at the bottom of the robot. Uh, this design will still be heavier. Uh, so at the moment, we are favoring the idea of adding a free fly tube or a drogue to the robot. Uh, so that should a increase tube, a tube. Yeah, <laughs> more fun that way, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and that will hopefully increase stability even more. And then this uh, this photo. Um, kind of shows the layout of where everything's going to be. Uh, so drag surface is at the top, as I say, with as much space for the parachute as possible. Motors and electronics beneath that. Uh, and then uh, the camera and the ballast, the, the main bulk of the weight of the robot at the bottom. And that pretty much sums it up. Yeah. Yeah. So at this point, uh, you might have noticed we said the word first a fair bit in this presentation. I think we probably racked up a, a couple of uh, beer fines in our time. So what we're proposing we do is uh, we pay our beer fine now. Uh, you guys can all come up to the front. 